God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for our consolation and salvation, which is effectual in enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be, or whether we be comforted, it is for our consolation and salvation. And um, like I said, I'm just going to give you what the Lord... Just gonna give you what the Lord laid on my heart. I uh, I got to thinking, and it was difficult for me to. to it's, it's it's difficult to think about and, and to ponder in, in your heart why why the Lord would would allow you to go through certain things and what it would allow you to suffer and experience pain and agony, and uh, and and going through them, you feel defeated at the time. And uh, I know I've been through certain situations. Where I just I felt like I had nothing left, like it felt like the Lord had just turned His face away from me. And it wasn't it wasn't until I got through that situation and I looked back and I and I saw the grace of God, right. and I saw that He was in every every moment of every situ, every every minute of that situation He was in it. He was there, right. even though I didn't feel Him. And so we experience these things. We experience these situations so that in them we might also experience the comfort that comes only from God. So that we might be able to comfort others with that same love and comfort that we ourselves received. And I felt ashamed when I was doing this. Because me and Brother Philip got to talking a few weeks ago after school, and with tears in the, and with tears in his eyes, he, he he mentioned something about his daddy, and I just stood there trying to muster something, trying to trying to come up with something, but there was nothing. I couldn't come up. I couldn't pull anything from out of there, and it's because I'd never been through that situation. Now I, I don't have a spot in my heart where daddy is supposed to be I've got a spot spot for mama I got a spot for her I got a spot for all of y'all but there's nowhere where daddy's supposed to be and I should have kept my mouth shut but but I said and I said it with some sincerity I wasn't being I wasn't being mean when I said it I can't sympathize with you and the whole ride home I felt I felt horrible I felt like garbage for for saying that and uh and the and the Lord let me to know let me to know that before I even got home that I, that I can sympathize with Him, and I, I and I can I I am capable of of sympathizing with people who and minister to people who have who have been through that and have felt that pain of loss. I might not have been through that exact situation, but I have felt loneliness, and I and and I have felt sorrow and pain that comes from death. And uh, if he was here this morning, I'd apologize to him. I already have, but I'd do it again. And so, no matter what you're going through, and so the, the, the Lord allows you to go through these things so that you can experience the comfort of God so that you can then minister to others. Uh, I believe that you first have to be ministered to in order that you can minister to other people, and uh, and I can tell you, I can tell you that there's victory on the other side, and that there's light at the mountaintop, and I know that God is faithful, and uh, Psalms thirty. I don't know if this even relates to it. Psalms 30, where you at? For his anger endures for a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may, weeping may endure for a night, 
but joy comes in the morning. And so, in, in your mourning, in, in your sorrow, you can find peace and joy if you'll look to the Lord. Not only does joy come in the morning, but I've heard people say that joy comes in mourning, M-O-U-R-N. And uh, that's all I have for this morning. Thank you, most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, for allowing me to do this once again, Lord. Thank you for, for ministering unto me as I was doing your devotional, Heavenly Father. I love you, Lord, and I, and I pray, Lord God, that, that you would bless the remainder of the day and each one that would get up to stand and teach and preach, Heavenly Father. And I pray that you'd be with us th- throughout the day. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How are y'all doing this morning? I certainly hope so. But um, anyway, we missed last week's Sunday school. So in order to do it justice, I'm going to try to cover not both of them, but uh, mainly the Lord didn't let me cover much of anything, but just a giant overview, if you will. So that's what we're going we're gonna to do real quickly. But anyway... Uh, of course, as everybody knows, the the uh, the book of Job is probably one of those books that's been persecuted uh, more than any other book. Uh, people in the modern times try to say that it uh, that it's not actually a, a literal man that that it went through all this suffering, but it was just a it was just a, a poetical book being stuck in between there. That obviously it was just meant to be that way. But I, I would I would venture to say this that that the uh, the, the the, uh, the first person uh, commentary, if you will, that we have in the book that goes back and forth, the discourse that we have between God and Satan and all these different things. Uh, in, in, in Jewish times, that, that would have been blasphemed just for a man just to write those things down if they weren't actually events that took place. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, uh, the only way that, that the author of the book could have known is to have divine inspiration as it says in, in uh, second timothy there but anyway the uh, the point of the matter is is that uh is that we find this man and we'll read the first five verses here in the book of job and then and then we'll, we'll get into it but it says uh there was a man in the land of us whose name was job and that man was perfect and upright and one that fear of god and the stew of evil uh and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters uh, he, his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one uh, his day and sent and called for their three sisters and did eat uh, and to drink with them, and it was so when the days of their feasting uh, were gone away that Job sent and, sacrif- uh, and yeah, sacrificed them and rose up early, uh, sanctified them, excuse me, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offering according to the number of them. For Job said, It may be that they, that, that, that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continuously. Now, uh, we've heard great messages on this, and, and I believe that, that this was proper. I, I've even heard some people say, well, well, Job ought not have done that, or, or, uh, or you know, uh, we can't do that today, or any of that sort of thing, and I'm not, I'm not here to argue that thing. But I will say this, that, the, that the, like I've already said, the book is the oldest book in, in the Bible. Uh, it's before Moses and it's before Abraham. We could probably fit this book uh, from all the research I've, I've done on it in the past little bit from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11. It fits somewhere in there. Uh, I believe, uh, and this is just Brother Joe's opinion, but I believe that, that Joe possibly, some of the events that are mentioned in the book, and, and uh, we have creation, we have flood. Uh, he mentions the flood more than anybody else in the, in the Bible. And then also we have... Uh, in chapter 12, I believe he talks a little bit about the Tower of Babel there, uh, where he starts talking about confounding the speech and whatnot. So I believe that we could fit it in there uh, with the with the Genesis 10, chapter 10 there with the with the generation of the nations. But uh, but I think that Job was probably a man that lived about 300 years after the flood, and uh, and so therefore it would make sense that those uh, accounts would be more fresh on his mind and and in that sort of thing. But but the thing that really spoke to me is that, uh, you know, with these first five verses, that he he done this. And, 
And uh, in, in Genesis 26, 5, we have, uh, we, have, we have no law given at this point, right? So there's no, there's no law. So how does Abraham know how to sacrifice? Why does he sacrifice? Uh, and he even speaks in the book of Job. In Job 23, 12, he, spe- he speaks of things that have been commanded to him, things that have been passed down from the mouth of God down to man. And then again in 22, uh, 22 uh, one of the friends mentions that these things have been put down. Now these, these tablets, or however they wrote them down, obviously uh, were not preserved and were superseded by the law itself uh, and by Jesus Christ eventually in the New Testament. But uh, we do know that in Genesis 26, uh, verse 5, that, uh, that we have that. And then again, we have it in, in Genesis uh, 22, uh, where he takes, uh, takes uh, Isaac upon the mountain. But anyway, I just wanted to read this real quick out of Genesis 25, because it, or 26, excuse me, because it, it gives you a, an indication that it was the, the head of the family, if you will, the, the head of the, part, the, uh, the patriarch, if you will, that, that would do the sacrificing uh, for the family instead of like it was under the law where you had the Levitical tribes that was doing it uh, for the nations. But in verse 5 it says, And because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, uh, my statutes, and my laws. Now, we, we all know that Abraham didn't receive the law or any of that sort of thing, but he kept those things. So obviously, uh, down from the beginning, uh, God had, had given man some sort of uh, rule book in which to, to, to operate in. And so Job was still operating uh, in, that, in that framework uh, and, and time. And so, uh, I won't read all the references, but like I said, it's in Job 23, 12 and Job 22, 22. And then in Genesis 8, 20, uh, we have a sacrifice that was given. And so that shows that the patriarch was the one in which that was able to do uh, the sacrificing. And so in, jo- in Genesis uh, 8, 20, it says uh, uh, 15, 15, yeah, there we go, 15 cubics upward uh, did the water prevail and the mountain overcover it. And all the flesh dieth and moveth upon the earth, but the fowl and the cattle and the beast and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man and all uh, those that that and all those that nourish up the breath of life and all those upon the dry ground died and every living substance was destroyed uh, with which the face of the ground and man and cattle and creeping thing and the fowls of the heavens and they were destroyed. From the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they took uh, with him uh, into the ark, and the waters did propel upon the hundred and fifteenth day. And so uh, I read in chapter seven, excuse me, uh, chapter eight, verse twenty. Let's see, there it is. And Noah built an altar uh, unto the Lord, and took of the of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered a burnt offering on an altar. And so we, we see that he established that there. Then again, like I said, in Genesis twenty two thirteen, 13, we got Abraham taking his son upon there. And so they knew about sacrificing. And then again, in Job 1, 5, it's mentioned. And then again, his friends mention it in, in Job 3, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. His friends mention it. And let's see here real quick here. It says, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Make sure I'm in chapter 3. Uh, Lo, let the night uh, be, and let no joyful voice come therein. Uh, lift not the curse in thy days. Who is ready to rise up uh, in the morning? Uh, let the stars of the twilight thereof be darkened. Uh, it look for light, but have none. Neither let it see the drawing of the day. Uh, because it shut up uh, the door as a mother's uh, womb. Uh, and so it's, it's referenced there that, or it's thought by, by at least uh, some commentators that, 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 that they're talking about the sin of man being, being ushered away as, a, as in the, uh, the, the womb of a mother or whatever. And so uh, 
in Genesis, like I've already said, I believe that this book probably fits within Genesis uh, 1 to 11. Uh, uh, like we, uh, we, whenever we were last here, uh, Brother Philip covered the uh, chapter 11 and covered the, the Mount, the, the Bible, and things of that nature. And so uh, I'm not saying that this necessarily uh, is uh, what this is speaking of, but in but large part it fits to me. Uh, so anyway, it's one of the discourses between, between Job and, and one of his friends, and it says, uh, And he leadeth princes away, uh, spoils, and overthrow the mighty. He removeth away the speech uh, and, the, and the trusty, of, and taketh away the understanding of the age. And so uh, to me that sort of references to the fact that, that he had done that sort of thing. If you back up in verse 17, it says, he leadeth counselors away, spoil, and maketh the judges fools. Uh, and so, in, in large part, uh, Job had, had another thing too that, that kind of uh, I had never really thought about whenever I looked at this was uh, nobody in this entire book ever questioned whether or not God was God. Just from the beginning of the book, we're just established, just like in Genesis 1 where it just says, in the beginning God, uh, in the book of Job, uh, you never have any of the friends say, "Well, you know, it could, you know, you could have been worshiping the wrong god. You should have been worshiping this god or that god." And so that leads us to believe that it was still at that unified sense where man just had one god, and there was no polytheistic or any of that sort of thing that had had branched in yet. Uh, and and I would argue to say that that large part we zoom upon the the suffering of Job, and we should, I think. Uh, I think that in order for a man to, to go through all that he went through, like God said in the beginning there, that he was a man, uh, that he was an upright man, and that he is stew of evil, uh, and that he was a righteous man. That's what God said he was, and so I believe that because he was those things, God knew he could count on him. But at the end of the day, Job never gets an answer by the end of the book. He never gets an answer or told why he went through all these things. Uh, he, he's never told about that conversation between Satan and God and so forth. God just shows up and says, this is you know, who I am and, and who do you think you are type of situation. But, but the thing is, is that I believe that Job was a man who was chosen for this suffering because of the fact that he was such a righteous man. Because of the fact that... And, and this is one of the verses that stuck out to me and I think it fits for our generation. I think this book if we were to seriously study, it applies more to our generation than what we give it credit for because of the fact that, uh, that there's a lot of things happening in, our, in our, our society and in our times that we don't understand why we're going through them, uh, but we're going through them nonetheless. But in verse 4 of chapter 2, it says this, and this really stuck out to me. This, now, this is a discord between Satan and God, and, uh, and God's telling him that he can do all this thing, and then he, then he had these boils rise upon his body. But, uh, but he says in verse 4, it says this, This is what Satan thinks of us, if you will. And it says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. All that a man hath he will give for his life. So, what does Satan think about us? He don't think much of us. If he thinks that you know we'll give up all our cattle, we'll give up our belief, we'll give up our convictions, we'll give up... Anything and everything. We'll give up our soul if it means that we can live. And if we not found that in, in, in today's world with, with, uh, with coronavirus, that, uh, that we're so scared to get out of the house, so to speak, uh, that we're just going to stay in there because, buddy, we can't get sick. You know what I mean? We can go everywhere but church. You know what I mean? Because you're going to get it there. And, uh, and that verse really spoke to me because I think that's where we find ourselves at. We, we, we'll give up everything just to live. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work more hours just so we can live a better life. You know what I mean? Uh, I can't come to church today because i got to work. You know what I mean? And I understand that. And I'm not you know, talking about folks that are working and all that sort of thing. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. That's between you and God. But, uh, but I will say this, that the, that the one time I did it, did it one time, I worked for a feller, and uh, I told him up front, I said, look, I ain't working on Sundays. And he told me, he said, that's fine, that's good, you know, I mean, whatever. And he asked me, he said, work one Sunday and I'll let you go to the afternoon service. I said, okay. Before I knew it, I was there until 10 o'clock at night, and I was mad as all get out. And, uh, and I told him, I said, it ain't going to happen again. I said, you can fire me or whatever, but it ain't happening again. Because uh, we ought to have convictions. We ought to have those sort of, sort of standards that, that, if, that if that's, you know, a problem, then we go find somebody that ain't got a problem with it. 
You know what I mean? But uh, but anyway, uh, that's the truth of the matter. But I mean, just that one verse. I really studied that one verse hard because, I mean, I think that's where we're at. I mean, as a, as a society, to me, that's a God's purging, if you will. Uh, purging, out, purging out who's real and who's fake. Because that's what happened here with Job. Because Job had these friends that showed up. And this is, well, this is one thing, too, I kind of p- pulled out of the book. God, w- uh, God put him in the hand of Satan. He put him in the hand of man. And he put him in the hand of God. Now, he, he triumphed over Satan like nobody's business. And, you know, I, I say this, and I, I've looked at it real hard, but I can't find anywhere where, God, where Satan, you know, compelled somebody or just got in somebody's face until we get to the New Testament with Jesus again. Job did such a great job of overcoming him and being victorious that, that we really didn't hear from him all that much uh, until the New Testament. And, uh, and he triumphed over Satan because of the fact that Satan put him through all these things and he still said whenever, and this is just me being, being a little bit, you know, taking a little bit of liberty, but he's but he standing there in front of them, them tombstones of his children or whatever, and he says, the Lord giveth and he taketh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, so he, he triumphed over Satan. He did not do what Satan said he was going to do here in verse, t- verse 4. He, he did not give skin for skin and give up everything that he had in his life. It was taken from him, but he didn't give it. All right, what, what it means is, is, that, is that God may take things away from us, but, but there's sometimes in life that we, we give things away. You know what I mean? We give away our dominion. We give away our right as, as men, as Christians, as whatever, just so that we can make it in society. I mean, uh, when in the workplace, you know what I mean? Somebody start cussing or, or throwing up a storm or whatever. We might walk off, but did we say anything? Did, did, did we really do what God wanted us to do? Should we, should we say, look, don't take the Lord's name in vain? You know what I mean? We might not have been the most popular fellow in the world, but at least we just took a stand, you know? But anyway, uh, and, then, and then we see him in the hands of men. Now, they had an Eastern tradition at this time that if, uh, that if the host didn't speak, nobody else could speak. Uh, that was an Eastern tradition, and so I think Job was trying to play that out. He, uh, um, now, again, this is just me taking a little bit of liberty, but I imagine that he was laying on his bed with all these bowls and all this stuff done happened to him, and he done had to, probably had the doctor come in. The doctor told him, so, man, Job, we ain't never seen nothing like this ever in our life. I mean, it's from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. We ain't never seen nothing like this. He said, you ain't got nothing that you can give me for the pain or, or any that sort of thing. And he says, no, we ain't got nothing, but I mean, we can rub some stuff on you, but I don't know if it's going to work or not. And, uh, and so they just apply that sort of thing. And then, then we've got these three friends. They come riding up, I, I imagine. And, and, uh, and Miss Job, she looks out the door there, and she sees them coming up. And she's already bitter and, and, uh, and upset and whatnot, and that's understandable. But, but anyway, he probably said something like, don't, don't let them in. You know, I mean, have you ever had that moment where you just didn't want to have company, you just, you just wasn't ready for it, you know? And just don't let them come in and for you, you know it. Don't even tell them I'm here, you know? And, uh, and then uh, she comes to the door and she says, what you want real bitterly like? And, and they say, oh, we come see Job. And she said, he's in the back, you know? And uh, so they go back there. And so Job had this, this, this plan, I believe. I'm just not going to say nothing. I'm going to wait them out. I'm going to wait them out. And so that's what he did. And for almost a whole week, he weighed them out. But guess what? Them suckers took night shift and, and uh, took breaks and went and, got, went and bought each other dinner and one stayed with him and the other two went and ate and the other two went and slept. And I don't know how they played it off. But either way, Job finally had enough and he broke and he said something and boy, he let loose on him. Just like that. And that's why we find ourselves with our friends. But you see, the thing is, is that Job didn't triumph over them. He, he gave in to his... To his, to his weakness and to his flesh. And I believe God put him in the hands of those people to show him. Even, you see, because God saw him as a perfect and upright man who was to evil and all those sort of things. And that was his standing with God. But he, but he still had an inner man. He still had those flaws, those weaknesses that we all have. I mean, whenever, whenever the Lord looks at us, He sees the blood of Christ and, and we're perfect and upright and we are still evil just as God did. Uh, but whenever we... We just look at our flesh and we look, look, at, look at the way we, we, we truly walk upon this earth. We're flawed. And, and we all are. And so I believe God put him through that thing with those friends because of the fact that he wanted to show him those parts of him that, that, maybe, that maybe Job didn't even know was there. That only God knew was there. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, there, there's, there's many different fascinations that you can go into. And then lastly, of course... Uh, 
which we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit deeper next time around. But, but lastly, he's put in the hand of God, and God, like I said, God didn't give him any explanation. He didn't say, this is what, this is why, or any of those sort of things. He just says, this is me, and, and, and who are you uh, compared to this? Uh, and, uh, and one thing, too, is that all the way through the book of Job, uh, the, the God, God is referred to as the Almighty more than any other book in the Bible. Uh, and so God is referred to as the Almighty. Now some people, uh, from some of the commentaries I've read, said that that was, uh, and I can't go into the whole word and how you call it and whatnot, but anyway, it boils down to the fact that uh, God was a nourishing God. Uh, that, that, he, that, he, that He was a nourishing God. It even, even kind of slightly gives like a feminine, feminine view uh, or side of God, and so I don't really uh, agree with that. Uh, at all, and so uh, I just think that it just meant Almighty, that He was He was mighty and He was Almighty, and so anyway, I believe that's I think believe that's proved out. Uh, I read a, lot, read a lot of Hebrew scholars that said that it just meant Almighty. It didn't have any hidden meaning or any of that sort of thing, and so uh, like I said before, I think that Job was a real person. And some people like to argue about whether or not he was real or not. Uh, maybe he was just uh, you know like one of those poetical uh, figures that are put in a book uh, so that we can, can branch out and give you a larger statement or whatever. But no, this, this was put uh, in the place it was put because that's where God wanted to put it. It wasn't put there because it was written during Solomon's time, and it wasn't put there because it was written after Solomon's time, uh, but it was, it was uh, always, uh, in early Judaism and early Christianity, it was always understood that Job was a man. Ezekiel himself in Ezekiel 14, four, uh, verses 14 through 20 mentions Job, and then again in James 5, uh, 11, Job is mentioned. And so uh, between those two references, uh, I think we're, we're pretty safe to say that Job was a, was a real man. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, 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 uh, that I thought was interesting that, uh, that I'll pull out here from, from uh, chapter 16 it says, uh, it says here in verse 4 of chapter 16, it says, And I also speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stand, and could heap up words against you, and shake my hand at you. But I will strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips uh, shall assuage uh, your grief. Uh, thus I speak, my grief is not assuaged, and thus I forbade, what am I, uh, a, a, uh, but now he hath made me uh, wavy, uh, thou hast made desolate all my company. And so uh, we, 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 we come to that, that close, and we, we had this last friend, uh, El Elazar, however you say his name there, he showed up, he was a young man, and, uh, and he pretty much took on the three friends and Job all at the same time. And to be completely honest with you, Job didn't really give him uh, an answer uh, to what he said. He, he kept talking like he had all these, these big things he could say. But, but anyway, Job didn't really give an answer because he didn't add anything or take anything away from what had already been said. But one thing that I did think was, was kind of ironic there is that it, uh, it says here that that he would lift him up and, and try to sway his grief. And, uh, and a lot of times we, we do that as people. We, we try to encourage folks and we try to, to help them throughout their, their time of grief. But, but really and truly through the whole entire discourse that we find with, uh, with Job and his friends, we don't really see anybody ever, you know, just stop and say, well, you know, why, you know how's Job doing? You know what I mean? But it was always about his sin and all these sort of things. And I, and I think it's because of the fact that he, that he was the greatest man in the East. That he, that he had possessed all that he possessed. That he, that he had the station, if you will, that he had in life. And so people just expected Job uh, to not have any feelings, I guess. And, uh, and a lot of times, I feel that same way. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, there's a lot of people in life that, uh, that, that they expect a preacher to come to the hospital and be by their side and do all the things they they expect a preacher to do, but whenever he's experiencing grief or whenever he's down or something happens in his life, nobody seems to want to, want to come and, and be there for him. Now, I realize that, that we're, we're all uh, different in, in this church and that sort of thing, and that's a blessing, but I'm talking about in a lot of churches that I've been in, 
if if the preacher didn't do right, then but he didn't get no quarter, and uh, and that's just not right uh, for for us to do, to do the man of God that way. And and Job had been here for these people uh, time and time again. He had been a righteous judge, I believe, uh, in chapter twenty three. I believe that that shows that he was a righteous judge. He himself says he was a righteous job, a judge. And then in, in chapter twenty three, yeah, I mean chapter twenty nine, it talks again about about his judgment, and how he walked through the court of the the city and, and how people would move out of the way and, and all these different things would take place. And so Job had been, I don't believe that Job could have been the man that he was or that God would have bestowed upon him because this is pre, pre-Old pre Testament, you know, uh, however you want to say it, pre-history, however you want to put that sort of thing type of man. And so his his outward gain was, was, was linked to how he served God, unlike in today's society where our our treasures are, are you know up in heavenly places and whatnot. In Job's time, a man's land, his standings, all those sort of things, uh, not only showed how he stood in society, but showed how he stood with with the Lord. And so those things were directly linked. And so uh, God had bestowed upon him more than anybody else. He had uh, uh, this is this is the way that that uh, that I heard uh, John Phillips uh, put it. Was that uh, that you know he was out in the middle of his field and he he had all those animals he had uh, everything going his way and uh, and then one of those messengers come up and and told him said they they uh, we've had a an Arab band that come in and they they've attacked your 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 camel train and so then he he goes into his office and he he, he kicks that off the the list uh, but he's okay because he still got he still got all this merchandise he still got all these. These she asses. He still got all these things to do, and then uh, one after one they keep coming, and then so finally he comes in and he and he uh, he goes in and he and he just tells his wife. He says, "Look, we're broke. Everything everything I had's gone, and and we're broke. But at least we still got each other and the kids." And then shortly after that, that whirlwind comes in, takes all of them out, and uh, and then it's just him and his him and his spouse, him and his wife, and uh, and and then. And it's good to have a good wife, but but uh, I'm not saying that Job had a bad wife. I'm just saying that uh, that she she gets a hard look at a lot of times whenever people preach and whatnot. But I mean, just imagine you've well, you've uh, economically you've had everything taken away from you. Then they rip away all your children. Uh, it's understandable that she would be bitter. Plus, she's supposed to be the weaker vessel uh, in that in that sense. That's what we're told in Genesis, and so it, it makes sense that Job would be would be the one to say, because he's supposed to be the head of the house, right? So therefore, however he directed uh, is the way the house was going to go. And so if he just threw his hands up and got bitter and, and got all, all upset and everything, then, uh, then, then it sure enough would have fell apart, but he didn't. And, uh, and I believe that's why we, uh, we see the things that happen. And, and one time in particular, we, uh, me and Brother Mark, we, we were in the jail. And uh, I don't even remember how this came up, to be honest with you, but... But we were in the jail, and, and one guy asked us about Job's wife or something of that nature, and uh, why he didn't, why the Lord didn't take her away, and and I, and I think me and Brother Mark had answered that, that it's because they was one flesh, and and, uh, and and they was one person basically, and that's why that's why God didn't take them away, and and uh, and that you know that that we weren't supposed to put necessarily as much value on on, on children and that whole thing because you know I mean you know what I'm trying to say, boy he got mad at us for his fist fight us. You remember that, Brother Mark? He didn't. He got ready. He got mad at it. He said, my kids are more important than that woman I had them with. And that's the society we live in today. That's the society we live in today. That, that the kids are put in the way wrong place. All right? Uh, then, uh, then, 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 then that relationship between a man and his wife. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, that, that happens. But here, uh, we never hear where Job actually said anything against her other than the fact that he said she speaks as a foolish woman. Which is the truth. She was speaking as a foolish woman. But uh, they were one. And, uh, and, and I believe that God gave us that picture to show us that. And, uh, and so it should be rightly that away. But, uh, but really and truly, honestly, uh, we all know what took place. And I ain't going to try to get political, but we all know what took place with, uh, with the campaign and, and who we necessarily have as our our president now, and, and that's a that's in the Lord's hands, and He knows what He's doing. But I believe at this verse four, if we've ever had a, a verse for for our time and for our generation, it would be that uh, that skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. 
And, uh, and we should really ponder on that and really think on that. What are we willing to give up for God? What, because ultimately, who give us that life? Who put the breath of life in our bodies? Who, who, who called us out and, and put us, uh, saved us and put us in the church, gave us the Great Commission, told us to go out and give the Gospel, told us that, 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 that great persecution and tribulation would come our way if we lived godly, and, and then whenever we, we have something take place like this, we just, as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole, as Christianity, we just seem to fall apart. Can't believe God, you know, God let that thing happen. All right? Well, I'm here to tell you that I ain't a post-millennialist or any of that other sort of stuff. All right? I, I, I believe in, in a pre-tribulational rapture. All right? And so therefore, uh, back, in, back in the early 1900s, that was a big thing. Everybody was post-millennialist, all that sort of thing. It was going to get better. We was going to constantly get the earth better. Man was going to solve all these problems, and then eventually God was going to come in, and He was going to inherit the earth. Well, I'm here. I'm sorry to hear to tell you that we all live under the curse. The curse is here, and and things have got to get worse before God will call the church out. Is that is that not right? I mean, does does, does do we not? We're not going to experience wrath like like God uh, is going to pour out upon mankind that don't believe upon Him or don't call upon His name. But we will experience persecution. We will experience tribulation. And so uh, we, we really need to evaluate this book, Job, and see how this man who had everything taken away from him. All right? And all we've had taken away from us is, uh, is what? A lot of freedoms. We, just through this one virus, we've had a lot of things that's been taken away from us. Uh, and, 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 and to be honest with you, it, none of us really fight or argue about it at first. You know what I mean? Because we didn't really see the big picture. But now, uh, I'm telling you, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. That's just my personal belief. But, uh, but the, the afflictions that we'll go through in, the, in this flesh far outweigh the, uh, the benefits that we'll have in glory. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just of the opinion that it, that it ain't going to get any better. It's got to get worse. All right, and in order for, for the rapture to take place, in order for, I don't believe there's anything that need to be done for the rapture to take place. Let me just say that, first off. But in order for the earth to get to the place where that man of sin can come in and be revealed and all the things that, that take place in, in Revelations to happen, everything's got to get worse. I mean, I mean we've got to, he got to be able to heal some wonderful something or other and, and make everybody think he's some fantastic something in order for that to happen. So anyway, uh, just... Just evaluate that, that, that verse, if you will, in your life. And, uh, and try, to, try to see where, where, what you have, have given up for, for life. And, and there's many different references all throughout the book of Job about creation, about uh, the breath of life, and, and uh, different things that, that are put in. And, and a lot of people zoom in on the suffering of Job and, and all those things. But, but the book also is... Uh, uh, very, very ahead of its time scientifically, and and just different things that that I looked at. But, but this, but this, uh, this verse four here, I, I really I can't I can't get past it just because of the fact that that uh, that you know we 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 are very patriotic people, and I, I'm very patriotic. Okay, and and people gave up a lot of things for for people. You know what I mean to have the freedoms that we have in this nation. Uh, through the Revolutionary War all the way up to, to the Iraqi War and, and Afghanistan. Men have shed blood just so we could stand here and do exactly what I'm doing now. But, uh, but the reality of the thing is is that, is that uh, they gave the ultimate sacrifice. They gave their life. A bunch of them. But, uh, but the Lord never asked us to do that. And we all heard that good message that Brother Gary gave on that. And, uh, and I, I think that's right. I think we ought to rededicate ourselves. We ought to get on that altar. We ought to stay on that altar. Uh, and, and make sure that we're there uh, and, and die to ourselves daily. But, uh, but what, 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 would, you know, what would be the thing that make us curse God and, and, and give it away? Would we? That's, that's the question that God kept asking me the whole entire time I was studying. And I'd go back to this, this one verse and I tried to get away from it. But I kept thinking, what is my prize? Do I have a prize? You know what I mean? Do, do you have a prize? You know what I mean? Would you would you betray God for whatever thing that that was given? Now, mind you, you can't have your salvation taken away. All right, so you you'll go to heaven, all that sort of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is is that what what would we jeopardize for 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 a stand and for 
for the living right and and all those sort of things. I mean, in, in society, we we have we already have uh, the most awful thing on the face of the earth, which is cell phones, TVs, you know, you name it. And don't get me wrong, I like them same as everybody else, and I I, I look at them and and I watch TV shows and all that sort of thing. But but if they start talking about homosexuality, are we gonna turn it? Or are we just gonna be like, eh? You know what I mean? I mean, it, it, that's, that's, that's an honest to God, real deal that we deal with today. I mean, in society, what, what things are we willing to, uh, to just say, well, that's not a big deal? You know what I mean? Can I, can I be honest with you? A lot of the commercials that come on TV, my granddaddy would have thought was soft porn. All right? I'm just going to be real with you. That's just the honest to God truth. I mean, he would have freaked out. You know what I mean? And so, I don't know. I just think about this book, Job, and I think about a fellow that went through all that suffering, lost all the things that he lost. He triumphed over Satan. He, he bent a little bit there in the hands of man. And then, of course, no man can, it is, it has a right to stand against God. I mean, whenever God shows up, his sovereignty is there. And, and Job bowed himself down and, and did exactly what every man should do and, and worshiped God and, and, and took in the truths that God had told him. But, but at the end of the day, Job didn't, he didn't give an inch. I mean, and, and they took everything from him. And he just, he didn't give. He didn't do what Satan said. He, he, he afflicted his body. He afflicted his, his pocketbook. He affected his children. He took them. And, uh, and, and Job didn't, didn't give an inch. And, uh, and the only thing is, is that I pray and hope that I could be a guy or a man of God or however you want to put it that wouldn't give an inch. That wouldn't, you know, say, well, this is my price. You know what I mean? If if you if if this happens, then th- then you know I'll give in here. And I'm sure that there's a lot of standards that I hold today that that people back generations ago would have thought, well, man, he's a liberal. You know what I mean? And that I mean I don't know. Maybe my mind's the only one goes there. But there's a lot of things that I think we accept in society that that our ancestors wouldn't have accepted. Father God, I come to you today, Lord. I thank you for the blessing of this day. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to stand and open your word, Lord, and I pray that, that uh, you would cleanse it of anything that was wrong, Lord, and I pray that you would uh, just help me, Lord, to, uh, to be that man that you would have me to be, Lord, and I pray that, uh, that it's been a blessing, Lord, and I pray that uh, they've learned something, Lord, and I pray that your will would be done throughout the rest of this day, Lord. I pray that you bless my pastor, Lord, and I pray that you would uh, uh, just help us, Lord God, in our song service to be pleasing to you. And Father God, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once I drifted out in sin had no hope, no joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and He showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I'll be lasted in the fight for the cause, the truth and right. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. From the straight and narrow way, Oh, I was drifting every day Out upon the waters deep and wide But it all is over now Glory light is on my brow And my soul is on the winning side on the winning side out in sin no more will I
truth and love. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. I will never have a fear, for my Lord is ever near. And in Him so often I confide. He's the keeper of my soul, once I gave for control and he placed me on the winning side well I'm on the winning side yes I'm on the winning side I'll be seen no more will I Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've been listed in the fight for the cause, the truth and right. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. You know, back in 1979, I got on the winning side. There's a lot of people think that because I don't live their way, I'm not saved. But I ain't seen nowhere it says I've got to live like the preacher. I got to live like any of you. All I've got to do is give my heart and life to God. And that's what I've done. And I never made a better move in my life. And I'm glad that I can say I'm on the winning side. All right, Sister Ruth and Sister Young. I'm turn that on. <laughs> He's a hand that holds me steady when the storm blows in to stay. He's a solid rock I run to when all else gives away. He's the shoulder that I lean on when my hope is died. He's the arms I fall into each time that I cry. I don't know what trust in Him will look like. What he might ask of my life I only know how far his love goes I don't know what the future holds for me Or where this lonely road will lead I only know I'll never walk alone When life just doesn't make the only one with power to wash away my sin who offers me forgiveness again and again he picks up the pieces when life falls apart he is the redeemer of my shattered heart I don't know what trust in him will look like what he might ask of my life I only know how far his love goes I don't know what the future holds for me or where the 
this lonely road will lead I only know I'll never walk alone When life just doesn't make sense I know who Jesus is When life just doesn't make sense whole lot of uncertainty right now, aren't they? A whole lot of folks don't know what they, what's going to happen, what to, what, what, what's going to take place. America's all up in the air about everything right now. Christianity, we seem like we've lost every, all hope and all our... But you see, it's, not, it's just not that way. I like what one, right, one fellow said, I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. And I'm on the winning side, amen. I'm on the right side. I don't know what I'm going to face. I may wind up being a pauper. I may have to sleep in the woods. We may have to meet under brush arbors again as a church. But there's one thing I know. It don't matter who's in the White House, brother. I still know who's on the throne in heaven. I'm grateful to testify that when this whole thing's on fire, the majority of this world right now believe that this is it. The liberals believe that, well, we've got our person, everything free is going to come, and the conservatives are scared to death. Nobody seems like Brother Mike, they're stopping and understanding that, boy, this is about God. It's not about me and you. One thing we can rest assured, we ought to rest assured that if you're saved, I mean saved this morning. I mean, no, you're born again. No, you trusted Jesus as your Savior. Well, you, ought to have high, you ought to have high hopes today because like Brother Hunter said, well, this thing ain't over with. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, I even changed it. I had an old deacon at the church I growed up in He'd lead singing. He'd sing that last verse. He wouldn't say 10,000. He'd say 10 million. When we've been there 10 million years, bright shining as the sun. You know what? God's still on the throne. He's still in control. Let's get out of our mullet grubs and get back on our knees. We prayed America out. We prayed America. We, we got a a president that did recognize God's people. We got complacent. You ain't gonna never convince me any different. We got satisfied. Well, we've got him now. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. May not be what we all want, but that's okay. God said, I'll never leave you. Neither will I forsake you. Y'all sing that last verse again of that song. I want you to listen to what, what they say. Listen to it. Listen to the words. Don't just listen to and watch, but, but listen to what the song say. Well, we still got some hope. There's still time for repentance. There's still time for lost folk to get saved. There's still time right now. Now, I don't know about five minutes from now, but I know right now, there's still time to get your heart right with God. Y'all sing it again. He's the only one with power to wash away my sin, who offers me forgiveness again and again. He picks up the pieces when life falls apart. He is the redeemer of my shattered heart. Trust in Him will look like what He might ask of my life. I only know how far His love goes. I don't know what the future holds.
calls for me Or where this lonely road will lead I only know I'll never walk alone When life just doesn't make sense I know who Jesus is Take it again. He's the hand that holds me steady when the storm blows in to stay He's a solid rock I run to When all else gives away He's the shoulder that I lean on When my hope is done He's the arms I fall into Each time that I cry I don't know what trust in him will look like what he might ask of my life i only know how far his love goes i don't know what the future holds for me or where this lonely road will lead i only know i'll never walk alone when life just doesn't make sense I know who Jesus is Miss Kayla, stay right there. Give me some ushers to come up, please. Turn to the book of Ruth. Chapter number 4, book of Ruth, chapter number 4, and we're going to begin to read with verse number 13, Ruth chapter number 4, and beginning to read with verse number 13. We'll finish up the book of Ruth this morning, we've been here since sometime I reckon Started here sometime around August in the book of Ruth. And uh, we're going to finish it up today. There's multitudes and multitudes more that we could preach, we could have to say. I even back up and look at some in the book of Ruth. But I feel like what the Lord wants us to do is, is finish it up today. And we're looking, uh, man, what a book we've read. What a, what a book. Just a, a, a tremendous book, a, tr- a powerful book. Uh, book that, and I know the whole Bible's that way, but there's some things about this little book of Ruth that is uh, so such a blessing, gives such hope uh, to to sinners. Let's us know God had a plan from the beginning. Y'all about three quarters sleep this morning or something. I'm telling you, y'all. Hey, we having church here at North Spoon Baptist Church this morning. All right, all eight, three of us are anyhow. Ruth chapter number 4, going to begin to read with verse number 13. Those of you that's awake, stand up. We're going to read starting verse number 13. Ruth chapter number 4, beginning to read with verse number 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. When he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became the nurse unto it. And the women, her, <clears throat> her neighbors, gave it, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Phares. Phares begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, 
Aminadab begot Nashlon. Nashlon begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz. And Boaz begot Obed. And Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begat David. Father in heaven, thank you, dear God, this morning for your precious word. And thank you, God, for one more time, one more privilege you give me to stand. And God, you know my heart today. You know, Father, everything that would be upon my heart. You know, God, the, the down sittings, and you know the uprisings. God, you know my faults. You know my failures. You know, dear God, everything there is to know about me. I've, I'm not hidden before you, God. You know me. I'm an open book before you. Regardless of whether I want to be or not, God, you know everything there is. And God, it's not just that way with me, but it's that way with everyone in this building, with everyone on this earth. God, you know us. You're, you're, you're very aware of, of the things that take place in our life in secret, dear God. And I beg you, dear God, this morning in Jesus' name, God, that you'd come and meet with us. God, that you'd make yourself known in this place. God, I pray today that in the precious name of the Lord Jesus, God, that you would speak unto hearts today. And God, give us what we need Lord God, I pray you would speak unto me and help me, God, to be the mouthpiece. God, that be pleasing in your sight. And God, you'd speak to the hearts of these, your people. And God, help us to leave here knowing that we've been in touch with heaven. That we've heard from a God on the throne. And oh God, would you speak with the Spirit of God. Give us Holy Ghost unction. God, preach, preach us. And, and I pray, God, you'd make preaching easy. And, and make hearing easier, God. And and that you'd help men to deal with the Word of God as the Word of God is applied to their lives. God, help me to apply the Word of God to my life. God, of those that are here today that's, not, that's lost, never have been saved, God, what a precious day, what a great day it'd be for them to trust and believe in the Son of God and to have eternal life. God, I pray the Holy Ghost come their way and convict their hearts and draw them like only you can do, dear God, and I'll cause them to see the urgency of being born again. And I praise you for all that you do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you so much for Jesus. For it's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you and be seated. We have a, a delightful ending to the book of Ruth, which greatly differs from its beginning. Wouldn't you say that? Well, you say, preacher, how is that? Well, Ruth began, the book of Ruth began with remorse, but it ends with rejoicing. Uh, the book of Ruth began with death, but it ends with life. The book of Ruth began with dishonor for God, but ends with honoring God. What a contrast we find from the beginning unto the end. But there's one thing about good conclusions. Good conclusions come about because of good conduct in the, in the people's life in this book. Uh, there's a reason that the good conclusions come about. It's because that there's a good God that sits on the throne of heaven. It's because there's a good Holy Ghost that deals in the hearts of men. And it's because there's a good Word of God that can draw men, women, boys, and girls to the place where that they need to be spiritually in a good standing with a holy God. A good finish is uh, uh, always has to do with a good performance. Amen. A lot of us want to finish well. How many of us sang that song? Finish well. Boy, we want to finish well. We want to finish. We want to get to the end, and we want to hear the Lord God say, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'll make you ruler of many." We want to hear that. That's our ambition. That's our desire. But brother, we want to do it on the cheap side, and we want to get it the cheap way. And it don't work that way. <coughs> it don't happen that way. It requires a good performance. Ruth chose the right things and the right ways. Therefore, when we get to chapter 4, we find that Ruth comes to the end and she's blessed mightily by God. Not only is Ruth blessed, but Naomi's blessed by God 
And not only is Ruth and Naomi blessed, but Boaz is blessed by God. Hey, hey, I'm telling you, God got everything lined up. Uh, and uh, we find a woman that came from, 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 uh, from Moab as a barren woman. Now, imagine this. I don't understand. But, but, but there was a reason she was married to Malon for 10 years and never was, never had a child. Thought about that? 10 years she was barren. Uh, I, I don't, must have, somebody said it must have been on his part. I don't know. May have been on his. May have been on hers. But I know God stepped in. God intervened, and we find. I want to preach to you. Let me just go ahead and tell you the subject this morning, so those so you can write it down if you'd like to. I want to preach to you on the subject from barren to blessed by way of brokenness, from barren to blessed by way of broken. You say, preacher, what do you mean? The Bible tells us that Ruth chose the right things and that Ruth chose the right ways. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, the Bible said, by faith, when, Mo when, Moses, when, when he, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen to this. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. I want to ask you first of all this morning, what kind of choice are you making? I asked how many in here this morning were saved and I saw nearly all the house raise their hands. Several didn't, a few didn't, and that's okay. It's all right to be lost as long as you don't die that way. All right? It's not a shame to be lost. It's just a shame to stay lost. Amen? It's a shame to be lost knowing that Jesus died for you and that He suffered for you and that you could have had uh, eternal life. The only thing about it is uh, when you leave this place, you don't know what the future holds. You don't know when your eternity is winding up or, or coming, to, coming to visit you. You don't know when your life is going to end. Uh, and before you end this life, you better make sure you've been born again. Amen? Better make sure you've been saved by the good, sweet grace of God. Uh, but you know there's choices to be made. But so many today are choosing to live a worldly life. I'm not talking about just the world. I'm talking about church folk. I'm talking about folks sitting under the sound of my voice this morning. Uh, that the choice you made is I'm going I'm to live it up. I'm going to serve the world. I'm going to do uh, what I want to do. I'm going to please my flesh. I, I'm going to do what, uh, what's the, the easy thing and the popular thing to do. And therefore, uh, you know, you choose in this worldly life. But there's going to come a day uh, when you're going to want to end well. When you're going to come to the end of it. And you want to say, you're going to want to say, ah, oh, oh God. God, I hope you, I hope you pleased with me. But listen to me. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's some things about that that you need to know about Ruth here. Uh, you, you wonder why in your life that you're trying to live uh, uh, the way you want to, uh, but everything falls apart. Nothing lasts. You can make all the money in the world. You ever notice that? You ever notice somebody gets all out of the will of God and uh, the devil? You know what the devil will do? The devil will bless you too. You know that? He'll bless you too. He'll give you the desires of your heart if He can. That's what He'll do. As long as you'll stay out of the will of God, as long as you'll stay away from the house of God. Y'all listen to me. And some of you are looking at me down one side, but that's okay. I'm glad I got your attention anyhow. Uh, but listen, uh, the devil will bless you. And Have you ever noticed when that happens that boy, the devil will begin to uh, give somebody, they'll make more money than they've ever made in their life. But they don't keep a dime of it. They still, they still broke as a hank by, by the end of the week. They still, they still just can't afford to, to, to hardly pay attention. That's just, that's just the way it is. It, I mean, they just can't do anything. You know why that is? Because you're investing in the wrong side. You're investing in the wrong thing. Some of you, you want to finish well. You want your family all saved. You want your children to all go to heaven. And you say, preacher, why do you always preach that way when I'm here? And it's just not because when you're here or because when, when that one's here, this one's here. It's that way all the time. You can ask somebody that comes pretty regular. And the thing about it is that you can have these questions. Why is everything falling apart? It's because that you're sowing the wrong seed. The Bible said about Ruth that she chose the right person to follow. Did y'all notice that? She had a choice. Do you know that? 
when she's leaving the land of Moab, I see, I see two girls making a choice. I see one making a good choice and the other making a foolish choice. I see one going back to her homeland, going back to the gods that, that, are, that are, her mom and daddy served. I see her going back and serving all those false gods and doing all those things. I see her going back and according to what Jewish history says, this, this girl, girl Orpah went back and according to Jewish history, she became the mother of three giants and, and, or four giants I believe it is. And the youngest one was named Goliath. That's Jewish history now. That ain't Bible. I'm just telling you what the history says. So we see it the right decision. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and she went back to Moab. But the Bible said Ruth Clavin to her. Ruth Clavin to her. She chose the right one to follow. We find that she also chose the right direction to go in. She went in the direction. She didn't speak to her. They didn't go walking on the way to Bethlehem, Judah, carrying conversation. The Bible said when they started on their way that she left speaking unto her. That means she quit speaking. They quit talking. And they just made their journey. At any time uh, uh, during the trip, she could have said, you know what? I feel uncomfortable going this way. Y'all listen to me this morning. Uh, she could have said, I feel uncomfortable going walking in the ways of God. I believe I'll go back to my old ways. Uh, but she didn't do it. She stayed the course. Uh, and she went the right way. And she traveled the right direction. And listen, God blessed her because of it. She chose, listen, not only did she choose the, uh, the right person to follow in the right direction to come, but she chose the right field to glean in. Hey, all the fields outside of Bethlehem, Judah, she happened on by happenstance. She happened to go by the one where Boaz was the owner. Ain't that just the goodness of God? Because she's designed to make the right decisions, God begins to step in and instruct her in the ways in which she'd go. Not only did she do that, but we find that she chose the right behavior. Woo! I could preach right there for a while. She chose the right. How is that preacher? Well, I tell you what she did. But when she went to the threshing floor that night to do what Naomi said, uh, she didn't go up there and lay beside Boaz's head. Uh, she didn't go give him a smack in the mouth. Uh, she didn't go up there and waller all over him. Uh, but she done the, uh, just exactly as way she was instructed. She laid uh, down at his feet. And not only did she behave right, he behaved right. And I'm telling you what, God blessed them uh, because they made the right decisions. Ooh, I wish you could see it like I can see it. I'm going somewhere if you'll just stay with me. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 9 says this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. You're going to reap. He didn't say you might reap. He said you're going to reap. But you're going to reap what you're sowing. You're going to reap. In other words, you're going to gather what you planted. If there's anything bothered me and kept me in the right direction, kept me straight when I was trying to raise my children, oh, I thought about what I didn't want them to turn out to be. What kept me going to the church, Brother Dean? What kept me from, from hanging the white tile up uh, when Baptists treated me wrong? Uh, and when I got uh, done, uh, you know, preaching, ain't that, that everybody think, boy, you ought to just be the preacher. Eh? You make easy money, work three hours a week, and that's hogwash. I don't know where you get that from. But you ought to walk sometime in the preacher's shoes, especially in your pastor's shoes, and find out uh, just what it is to it. But let me tell you something. Uh, uh, that, uh, what kept me straight, and what kept me, uh, when I'd lose, 
lose focus and get my focus back in was knowing that there were some little ones walking behind me and that their eternity and there was some coming behind them that their eternity depended on whether or not I made the right choices. And I'll tell you, I find Ruth, she stuck with her guns. Ruth's pattern was a pattern of good choices made for a great end to her story. Boy, that's just a sound like a fairy tale, don't it? Moab, coming out of the land of Moab, coming to Bethlehem, marrying a rich man, kinsman, redeemer, having a son, and this son's going to be the granddaddy of the king of Israel. Well, that's a fairy tale, isn't it? No. It's the importance and it's making right decisions. And it's having God's blessings on your life. It's everyone's desire to finish well. Right? How many of you want to finish well? I don't want to get to the end, Brother Will, and throw in the towel and give up and run out in the world. Now, I may very well do it, and God help me, I hope I got grace enough not to, but I pray that I can, I can hold the line. I pray that I can stand the course. I pray that I can keep the faith. I pray that I can fight the good fight, Brother Hunter. I want to stay right. I want to stay right. I want to finish well. But I'll finish well because I've made the right decisions. If we plan to finish well, we need to start doing well. I want to look this morning at the plan of rejoicing. There's no doubt there was some rejoicing took place here in this scripture. Look at verse number 14. The Bible said, look at verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Look at verse 14. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. I want you to look at the, at, at, at the plan of rejoicing. Now, none of this happened without God having his hand in it, first of all. None of this happened without God saying, okay, this is my plan and my will. Boaz, we know, is the foreshadow of Christ as, a, as the kinsman redeemer. What did he do? Well, when you look at the gospel work in redemption, uh, let's look at, at, at that, God, the gospel's work in redemption. Look, look at, at Boaz. What did he do? He paid an unpaid debt. Uh, he paid a debt that, that he didn't know, but in order to, uh, to gain the one that he had loved uh, and the, uh, to gain the bride that he wanted, he had to pay her debt. Uh, because she was indebted and he was the only one that was able the kinsman that was able to, to do that and was willing to do it we looked at that last Sunday he was the, or Sunday before last he was the only one willing to do that he paid an unpaid debt he pledged his love for an unwanted bride hey hey I'm telling you they ain't men they ain't a God and they ain't a bunch of gods on the throne today they're standing in line waiting to claim a bunch of folk like me and you you. There's only one that's willing to love mankind enough and that's his name is Jesus and he stood there and he paid the debt that he, we could not pay for ourselves. He loved a bride and he pledged his love for an unwanted bride. You say, what do you mean unwanted? That first McKinsman that come by the way, he said, I don't want her. I don't want her. You can have her. I don't want her. Boy, I said, I'll take her. Bless God. I'll take her. She's mine. I'll love her. I'll love her. I'll treat her the best I can. And I'm glad to testify today that we ain't been to the marriage yet, but there's coming a day, bless the Lord of heaven. I'm telling you, there's coming a day or there's coming a time or there's coming a moment in our lives or in our eternity when we're going to those of us been saved by the good, sweet grace of God. We're going to be joined together with our kinsman redeemer, with our heavenly redeemer, and we're going to see him as he loves us. And look, he pledged his love for an unwanted bride you find in the Bible the Old Testament tells us that the Gentiles had to become Jews to get in had to become Jews 
But brother, in Romans chapter 11, God tells us that he turned from those Jews and he looked at them, them, them unwanted ones. Them that earlier in the Gospels that Jesus said, we call them dogs. And God said, I love them. Oh, you know what God's plan was all along? To redeem the lost world. Uh, it didn't just occur to God in Romans chapter 11 that I, you know what God always did throughout the old Bible, throughout the new Bible? He always redeemed those who would come to him. He always redeemed them. He always, it didn't matter where they was. Now they did have to do it his way and we still got to do it the right way. But his way is Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life and no man. He's not a way. He is the way. I'm telling you this morning, there's not many ways. There's one way way to get to heaven and it's not by you doing good and keeping the Ten Commandments and being sweet. It's by believing and trusting and getting born again by the good sweet grace of God. And he paid an unpaid debt. He pledged his love for an unwanted bride and he pre produced a good ending to this little book. That's what he did. That's the gospel work in redemption. But let's look at number two, the gospel work in a new birth. It was a uh, a newborn child that brought the good ending to this book. Y'all notice that? What made the good ending? There was a newborn child come on the scene. Where was he born at? He was born in Bethlehem. Woo! Foretelling that there's coming a day down the road that there's going to be one born in Bethlehem greater than Obed. There's going to be one born in Bethlehem that's going to stir the town. There's going to be one born in Bethlehem, Judah, that the shepherds will even know about. That there'd be one born in Bethlehem, Judah, that all the women would talk about. There'd be one born there in Bethlehem, Judah, that God would shine the light upon. Hey, let me tell you, all of this is foretelling what. God's plan was it's all foretelling they rejoicing in Bethlehem Naomi has got a grandson you know really really and truthfully it's not Naomi's grandson really and truthfully it's not really and truthfully the best thing it could be was Naomi's nephew But I see because of the birth of this child that he became heirs and joint heirs. <laughs> yeah. Because of the birth of this child that Naomi became, had got what she never had had before. It was a newborn child that brought the good ending to this book. You know what soul salvation does? Listen to me. Put your God-given eyes on Brother Billy Ray. You know what soul salvation does? It brings a good ending to your life. It'll bring a good ending. It'll bring an ending like you can't even imagine. It'll bring an undeserved ending. I can promise you that. We all deserve hell. We all deserve to burn forever. And there is a hell. And it's on fire today and there's people by their souls of men, women, boys and girls that's on fire in hell right now. There's people burning in hell right now. I'm talking about their own, their own fire right now in hell. And only those that don't go to hell, the only ones are, are those that have been born again. Those that have been saved by the good grace of God. They're the only ones. Soul salvation. Hey, there was a day I was on my way to hell. There was a day I was deserving of hell. Still deserving of hell. Still ought to have to go to hell. But God stepped in the way. But God made a way. But God sent his son. But God sent the Holy Ghost my way and convicted me of my need of a Savior. Ought to be in hell. But God said differently. Verse 14 shows us some, some rejoicing that took place in Bethlehem. These women. Can't you? I just, I don't mean no harm now. But I can just imagine a bunch of women getting together. Can't you? You fellas, y'all know y'all with me. I love you women. I'm not talking. But listen, eh? boy, that bunch of women done got together and they done seen a baby. Oh, ain't nothing like a newborn baby to a bunch. You watch when, you watch when Hannah brings that baby here to, to the church house for the first time. Son, it'll be like a flock of ducks. They'll all be gathered around that baby. They'll, they'll all be talking about how pretty it is and, and how it ain't got to even be pretty and they'll still call it pretty. 
Y'all know I'm telling it right. I ain't seen very many, too many pretty ones. I'll just be honest with you. Most of them, when I seen them dried up and like a prune, I'm talking about they shrunk up and wrinkled and, and everything. Uh, wait till Miss Nikki brings that in here for the first time, that little girl. Wait till it happens. They'll be like a buzzer. Oh, she looks like Anthony. No, I think she looks like Nikki. I think she looks like Bryson. Did I, Brandon? Brody, I done heard some of them. They looked at that little picture they took in and they said, there's Brody right there. I, I looked at it and I said, there's Brody Dean right there. But that's what'll happen. Can't you imagine the day? Can't you imagine when they all gathered around Naomi? That boy, the, you talking about the day of the party going on. There was some rejoicing taking place. Why is that? Because somebody had been born. Bible said there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when a soul comes to know the Lord Jesus. I used to preach that and used to say that the angels rejoiced. I heard the songs written about the angels rejoicing. That ain't biblical. That ain't Bible. Why is that? Because an angel don't know no reason to rejoice. They ain't never been, they, they, listen, they don't, they, they, they not sinful like you and I are. But there's one there that paid the debt of sin. There's one that knows the way to sin. There's one that knows the penalty of sin. What are you saying? I'm telling you there, them angels are gathered around the throne and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. And in the presence of an angel, there's a good God of glory and the Lord Jesus. And he stands up and says, another one just got born again. Another one just got saved. You say, preacher, what do you mean? You think God pays attention when a sinner gets saved? Well, if he didn't pay attention, he didn't get saved. Amen. I see the rejoicing. Let's look at the cause of the rejoicing. I see the stir of these verses is the fact that a baby has been born. Let's look at the commitment for the birth. Now, we're going to change gears here just a minute so y'all stay with me. Let's look at the commitment for the birth. Verse 13 said, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. When he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Oh, look, first of all, the commitment in the marriage. Boaz kept his word. You know that? Boaz kept his word in the matter of the marriage. He was faithful. When he left the threshing floor early that morning, Ruth may have had the thought in his mind, in her mind he probably ain't going to come back. He may not come back. But Boaz kept his word. Well, you know, the Bible said, Peter said this, in the last days there'll come scoffers amongst the face of the earth, saying, where is the promise of his coming? He said, uh, we ought not worry about that. He said, because the same Lord over all is rich and all that call upon him, that's right one thing, but he said this also. He said, you know this, that just as sure as he left, he's a coming back. Them angels stood in Acts chapter 1 and as, they, as those fellers watched Jesus go up into heaven. And they said unto him, Why stand ye gazing into heaven? For the same Lord that ascended will come again in like manner. Hey, listen to me. I, you may sit here and wonder, well, preacher, I've heard all my life that Jesus is coming. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. He's coming. He's still coming. I see the commitment. Boaz kept his word. John chapter 14, verse number 1. God said, in, Here in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, neither do we know the way. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me tell you today, I want you to know there's a commitment that's been made. There's a commitment that God's made and he said this he said I'm going to my father's house and if I go I'm coming again if I go I'm coming again and you can rest assured that you don't that, that you don't need to worry God's coming again he'll keep his word the son of God is coming we see faithfulness must still 
be associated with a marriage. This marriage, is, he kept his, he kept his word. I want to tell you this, I see he kept his faithfulness. There can never be a good marriage without faithfulness. Like I said, we're switching gears here a little bit now. I want to look at the morality of the commitment. Boy, we live in a day when it's a common... Hey, listen to me. I, got, I, can't, I can't leave here right now. I'm talking about faithfulness. I'm talking about faithfulness in marriage. Let me just tell you, we're living in a day when faithfulness in marriage is something that's very far off. <laughs> I'm going to let it sink in just a minute. Faithfulness in marriage is something that's taken lightly. Men being unfaithful to their wives, wives being unfaithful to their husbands. Amen. I know we made out of flesh, but we oughtn't to go around lusting. Amen. You ought to control yourself, preacher. You know how hard it is. You know how I look. How that you can't help but look. Oh, you can help it. You can help it. Don't go. Don't go there. You can help it if you want to. It's got to do with our lust. Notice this about the morality of the commitment. The Bible said, so Boaz took Ruth. And notice this. He took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception. There's an order to that thing. Did y'all get it? I know who we're we at and I know what I'm talking about, but I just got to preach it. God done, he done preach this to me already this week. Uh, Boaz went in unto her after he was married to her, not before. Amen. It's not okay. It's not right. Sex is not to be performed as a hobby amongst unmarried people. I didn't come here to hear this this morning. Well, ain't you glad you lucked out and got here anyhow? This child was not a result of an immoral encounter. Uh-uh. You know why? Because sex is, rever is reserved for marriage. It's a gift of marriage. Anything else? <laughs> it ain't time to pray. Raise up your head. Anything else is immoral. Now I know they say preacher, but I messed up in my life. I, I listen. I'm glad that God's, that He's a second chance God, ain't you? I'm glad. But listen, because you messed up don't mean your preacher ought not preach about it. Amen. Amen. Because you, you messed up don't mean your children ought not hear the warning about it. And let me just say this. Uh, I want you to know that, that that is a gift of marriage. That's what it is. Ruth nor Boaz conceded to the lust that was there. But they stuck to their morals and they did that which was right. They did not give in to a heated moment of passion. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse number 1 is so good. If you're never tempted with that, you'll never come to surpass it. You'll, if you're never tempted with it, you'll never fall into it. Y'all, hey, y'all know when you do, do me like this, it makes me want to hammer more on it. So you might better pay attention. You can turn and look out the back door, but I'll come get in your ear. Listen, it's un ungodly. I'm telling you, Ruth nor Boaz didn't, con and we don't have to. It's a proven fact. You can keep yourself pure to the marriage altar. The thing is that so many don't want to. We ain't worried about finishing well. They did not give in to a heated moment of passion, uh, like I said, 1 Corinthians 7, 1, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. 
Because when that, after that touch happens, well, ain't no telling what's going to happen after that. They kept themselves from even the wrong thoughts being made about them. They didn't want nobody to even think that they were doing wrong. So therefore, they didn't get seen together. Imagine that. Most of the folks, they don't care what they think about me. I don't care what, what, what they, I'm, I'm going to just tell y'all. Y'all need to be back tonight because God has burnt one in my heart tonight that's going, whoo. I don't know if I don't know why, but God has burned it in my heart that I that things need to be addressed. Bible said in Hebrews 13, verse number four, God, God said here, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. It's still honorable to marry. And it's, it's honorable to, to consummate a marriage after the vows. That's when it's what's still honorable. But there is a category for those who put the cart ahead of the horse. What do you say? Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. To finish right, it's always good to start right. Let me tell you this, those of us there, those of you that's made mistakes in your life, those of us that's made mistakes in our life, but those that have made mistakes in fornication, don't glorify your sin. Don't glorify your sin to your children. Matter of fact, it ought not be talked about a whole lot. It ought not to be mentioned a whole lot. You ought not get up and even testify about it. I believe that. Well, I used to run around. I used to do this. And I run on my wife. And me and my wife had to Don't do that. Don't do that. That ain't glorifying God. That's glorifying the sin of your past. Whatever you've done, you repent of it and say, God, I'm forgiven. I'm forg you know, I promise you this, the devil ain't going to let you forget it. But every time you bring it up, you hurt another person. Don't do that. Don't glorify your mistakes. It's a blessing to come to the end of this thing and testify that you've only had one partner. Ain't very many folks can do it. But there's still a few. And I, I know I'm preaching on Sunday morning. I don't know why God got me here, but I, I tried my best to run off from it and leave it alone. But it's a blessing to get to the end of life. And when you get to the end, when you look at your wife or your husband, and to know that she or he's been the only one. It's not a bad thing, Brother Joe. That's a wonderful thing. Y'all hearing me? That's a wonderful thing. It's not bad. It's good. It's so good. You ain't got to go in Walmart and look down the aisle and if you see somebody, so, huh. y'all know what I'm talking about? You ain't got to do that if you just got one. Whew. I know this is tough on Sunday morning. But I want to finish well. I don't want to stand before God and God say, boy, you didn't tell your church what I told you to tell them. And some of you may not be back, but that's between you and God. I want you to know that there's a blessing at the end. It may come through brokenness. Can you imagine how, how Ruth must have thought that morning that Boaz left the threshing floor? And he said, there is a Redeemer that's nearer than I. And said, I can't do nothing until if He won't have you, 
than I will. Lord, he, he, she was already in love with him. She was already desiring to be his wife. And he said, there's a Redeemer that's near and high. And he walked away, or she walked away, knowing that it may be another Redeemer that comes and gets her that day. Imagine she sat there broken. <laughs> Imagine she sat when she went and told, listen, read the story, read the account. It got serious around that place. You read what Naomi said. You see, what, what, that surprised Naomi even, that there was another kinsman beside Boaz. It surprised her even. Go read it and find out. But I find this, that, that I, I find out that, that maybe they were sitting around there and they was, oh, they was wondering. I wonder. I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what's going to happen. And then later on down, after the deals made at the city gate, hear footsteps coming to the door. And all of a sudden, somebody knocks on the door and they look at one another. And they say, and Ruth eases up. And she eases there to the door. And she opens the door. She opens the door open. And there stands Boaz. And he said, I'm here to make you my bride. I'm here to take you. You're mine. I bought you. You're mine. I bought you. You're mine. She had been broken just a few hours earlier. But now she was blessed because her kinsman, her Boaz, had came up. Listen to me, y'all, and I'm done. There's some brokenness that maybe things we have to go through. I don't understand why we have to go through things just like Brother Joe said this morning in Sunday school. I don't know why we have, I don't know why Joe went through what he went through. I don't know other than God wanted to show us and God wanted to get glory from it. I, I, saw, I don't know. I don't know, Brother Mike, why that happened. I have no idea why God done that, but I'm glad that I can read the book and I'm glad that I can see if you stay the course that you can finish well. Just Dorothy, I don't know why you're going through what you're going through, but if you'll stick with it, it's going to be a happy day. It may not be here, but it's going to be a happy day. There's going to be a happy day. I don't know why old brother John's going through what he's going through. I don't know why he's facing what he's facing. I don't know why he's suffering what he's suffering. But I can bet one thing. There's going to be a happy day for long. There's going to be a happy day. It may require brokenness. It may require hurt. But there'll be a blessing. When you study the book of Ruth, you'll find that through everything, God was always there. God was there in her decision. God was there in her journey. God was there in her labor. God was there in her hurt and heartache. And God was there when He looked at her life. And he saw a little Moabite girl. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you in my family. She didn't just get in Naomi's family. But she got in God's family. I don't know if y'all see, are y'all getting what I'm talking about right here? But she didn't just get in, in Boaz's family. But she got in God's family. How is that when you go to Matthew chapter 2? You find over there when, G, when they give the lineage of the Savior and it said there was Ruth the Moabite. Woo! There she is. That her son bore a son who was Jesse. Who bore a son who was David. Who bore a son 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 wound up laying in a manger. Where? In Bethlehem, Judah. And he caused a stir in the town. And he's still causing a stir today. 
Oh, he still stirs in my heart today. He still stirs in the church today. Because there's a little Moabite. If it's said, I want to finish right. I want to finish well. I made mistakes, but I want to finish well. Honor, we've made mistakes, haven't we, son? But we want to finish well. And that's the good thing about God. We can finish well. I don't have to succumb to my past. I don't have to stay on that road. I can change the way and God will forgive me and He'll cast it as far as the east is from the west and He'll never remember it anymore. And we can finish well. We can finish well. Miss Ruth, will you go to the piano, please? I don't know your heart this morning. I don't know if this made any sense to you. But oh, God help us this morning. That we can have a desire to finish well. How are you? If today was the end for you, will you listen to me? If today was the end for you, how would you stand? How would you finish? If right now you stood before God, how would you stand? Maybe there's some of you this morning you say, Preacher, I want to finish well, but I ain't even saved. I ain't even sure I'd go to heaven. You can be sure before you leave here this morning. I can't save you. But I know somebody who can. Why don't you come this morning? Why don't you come? Hell's real, y'all. And she is enlarging herself and the coming of the Son of Man is at hand. The Lord is not slight concerning His promises. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Would you come? Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege one more time you let me stand. Thank you for this sweet little book. Thank you for my Bible. And God, would you bless it this morning? My feebleness and my failures. Would you remove them out of the way, God? And God, would you help somebody be blessed by your word? Thank you, God, for the Lord Jesus, my Redeemer. Thank you for the day that He sought me out. Oh, thank you for the day that, God, that when I called unto you, you heard me and you saved me because of Jesus. And I love you. And help me to love you more. Bless those that said, Pray for me. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wonder what might be on your heart this morning. How are you going to finish? If it was the end right now, how would you be finishing? How would it wind up with you? If it was all said and done, what would God say? Would He say, enter in into the joy of thy Lord? Or would He look and say, depart from me? For I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. You ain't never been saved. That's what you'll hear. Depart from me. Wonder this morning. Would you come? Would you trust him? How's it going to end for you?